This is Scenes from My Life. I just want to start with a brief author's note that says, contrary to recent trends in the field of memoir writing, all of the following scenes from my life are true, factual, and eminently verifiable. Nothing has been created, enhanced, or embellished in any way. Part one, hot water. I'm tied up and in an enormous kettle filled to my shoulders with water. The water is warm because there is a fire beneath the kettle, but this will not be the case for long. Soon the water will become very hot indeed, and then it will boil. This is the point, to boil me alive and then eat me. I am in the middle of a village in the heart of darkest Africa. Dancing around the kettle are a number of greased, savage warriors, magnificent specimens all. They are shaking spears at me and chanting, Ooga Booga, Ooga Booga. Their chanting is accompanied by the drumming of a number of comely, bare-breasted young women. The warriors themselves are wearing only loincloths. The firm, ripe breasts of the women jiggle fetchingly in rhythm to their drumming, but I've no time to notice this. Just as the water is becoming truly hot, the village witch doctor approaches the kettle. He is wearing more than just a loin cloth. He is adorned with one necklace made from the claws of a lion and another from the teeth of a crocodile. He is also wearing an enormous wooden mask, which gives him a truly frightening countenance. In one hand, he clutches a stone knife, and with the other hand, he is leading a young girl towards me. She is holding a drinking vessel made from an emptied coconut shell. He will slit my throat with the knife, she will then catch my blood in the shell, and they will all drink it. The chanting, drumming, and dancing have reached an almost fevered pitch. Just as the witch doctor is about to draw his knife across my throat, there is a sudden flash of lightning, and he is struck down dead. The savages decide that Shangu, their god of thunder, is displeased with their actions. I am released, made headman of the village, and given five wives. Part 2. Silken Sleeves I am lying on a pile of dirty straw in an opium den in Shanghai. I think that I have been here for three days, but I am no longer certain of the passing of time. I have been lured here by the promise of a young Chinese woman who will introduce me to some of the timeless mysteries of the Orient. The young woman is brought to me. As I reach for the sash of her jade-colored robe, I notice two things. The first is how truly young she is. The second is that there is a tear in her left eye. She is not here by choice, but by coercion, and is clearly unhappy. I resolve immediately to take her from this place, adopt her as my ward, and give her a good education in the West. But first, I must get her past the five muscular, well-armed Chinamen that the mama son of this establishment employs to enforce her will. I shake my head clear of the opium fumes and make known my intention of leaving and taking the girl with me. I am attacked with knives, hatchets, panji sticks, and shirakun, a razor-sharp, star-shaped throwing weapon that momentarily pins my collar to the wall. One particularly boorish fellow even presumes to point a revolver at me. Fortunately, due to my many years of training and study in a Shaolin temple, I am a master of the arts of physical self-defense. I subdue my five opponents and leave with the girl. Her education in the West is now nearly complete, and she will soon be returning to the Orient as a physician of children's maladies. Part 3. Alpine Pursuit I am skiing down a mountain pass high in the Austrian Alps. It is not an official ski trail or slope. This passage is far too dangerous for the general public and should be attempted only by someone who is in extraordinary physical condition as well as being an Olympic grade skier. I happen to be both. I am racing downhill, very fast, as if my life depends upon my velocity, which in fact it does. Fifty meters behind me are Colonel Kalgunin of the KGB and three of his most ruthless assassins. They are all championship skiers. They are firing machine guns that have been made to look like ski poles at me. I am zigzagging and slaloming, and thus far they have missed me. There are crevices and cliffs to either side, and my situation is growing more perilous by the second. Just as I succeed in putting more distance between myself and my pursuers, and begin to allow myself to think that I might actually survive this ordeal, the unimaginable occurs. A helicopter, theirs, appears and opens fire on me. I am skiing between parallel lines of machine gun bullets that are hitting the soft powder snow. This helicopter is also equipped with a number of air-to-ground missiles that, while they do me no harm, pulverize several small boulders. Making cunning use of a small hillock, I swerve suddenly 90 degrees to the right. This causes Kalgunin and his men to accidentally fire on their own helicopter. The gas tank is hit, and the chopper explodes in a burst of orange flame. It then crashes into the side of the mountain and explodes again. Perhaps the ordinance on board has caught fire? I've no time to ponder this. To the jubilation of my pursuers, I hit straight over a cliff that gives way onto an 8,000 meter drop. I look up and see the triumphal smiles and ecstatic gestures of Kalgunin and his men. 
I allow myself to free fall for 3,000 meters, well out of machine gun range. I then pull the ripcord of the parachute hidden beneath the cummerbund of my tuxedo. I float safely onto a soft patch of white snow at the base of the mountain. Kalgunin and I will meet again. It might be in Istanbul. It might be in Montevideo. I don't know where. I only know that we will meet again. And the next time I will not be the prey. I will be the hunter. Part 4. Frontier Justice. I am riding swiftly through Comanche territory. It is not fear of the natives that propels me, but rather the urgency of my mission. I have been on friendly terms with the Comanche for many years now, ever since I saved the life of their chief, Soaring Eagle. I had found him in a gully with a broken leg, and suffering from the effects of rattlesnake bite. I set his leg, drew out the venom, stayed with him until he was fit to travel, and then brought him to his people. He rewarded me with the gift of his most beautiful daughter, Little Feather, who was my beloved wife, wife and mother of our two young sons. I was also honored with a name, Teok Menomloha Talabuna, a sign of affection and gratitude. It translates roughly as, the only white man the natives will trust. As a further sign of their goodwill, their raiding parties will generally leave my town of San Padre alone when they go on the warpath. So no, my rapid travel through their country is not due to any fear of hostile action on their part. Rather, my galloping ride of Domingo, my trusted mount of many a skirmish over the years, is due solely to my mission at hand. And that is this. Since I have been away from San Padre, doing some special work for the governor in Austin, our state capital, dire things have been going on back home. Beal Barton and his men, the so-called Black Beal Gang, because of the supposed color of their hearts, have moved into town and are running roughshod over our people. I've received a telegraph that informs me that they are disrespecting our women, taking items without payment from the general store, insisting on whiskey without charge at the saloon, and riding their horses at great speed upon the boardwalk, scattering our decent folk. It is even reported that they have punched the Reverend Lawler, one of the pillars of our community, for upbraiding one of them for spitting tobacco juice on one of our ladies' chassis. I am the U.S. Marshal responsible for San Padre. The sheriff is a fool and a coward, and a drunkard to boot. His deputy, Ezekiel Festus, is a fine young man and shows great promise but is too inexperienced to handle the Black Beal Gang. It is all up to me. I know that the gang is expecting me to approach town from the east, from the direction of Austin. Instead, in a wide encircling lope that takes me many miles out of my way, I approach San Padre from the west. With the setting sun in their eyes, I engage the outlaws and immediately, immediately kill three with my rifle. The remaining four surrender and are taken into custody with the assistance of young Deputy <coughs> Zeke. They are hung several days later. The only one I feel badly about is Beale's younger brother, Elmer Barton. I had always thought that the young man to not be criminal in nature, and that with a different guide in life, might well have turned out differently. But, as he followed his brother's path into lawlessness, so he had to pay the ultimate price. Part 5. Houston's Problem. Planet Earth has never looked more beautiful than when seen from this vantage point. A fragile blue and white gem floating in the inky blackness of the cosmos. Just gazing upon it fills me with emotion, though I know this is no time for sentiment. I think of all the world's peoples, their wars, their ethnic hatreds, their man-induced famines, of all the greed and senseless waste. I reflect on the fact that humanity, for all its warts and glaring imperfections, is at this moment united in one common prayer. From Saskatchewan to Santiago, from Moscow to the Maldives, from Beijing to Beirut, all mankind is at one moment joined in this one, one fervent wish. And that is this for the safe return of me and the two men with whom I serve. Ever since things went so horribly awry during the launch, all my attention and skill has been focused on the one goal of getting my crew back home. Our mission to the moon was scrubbed the moment we cleared the stratosphere. Our thrusters were irreparably damaged and our oxygen supply seriously compromised. I look at my two comrades. I gaze out the portal at home. I'm almost overcome with emotion, feelings of pride and companionship that defy expression. I suppress them. There is a job to do. Before a man can command others, he must command himself. I compose my words carefully. I tell them that there is a chance, albeit a small one, that we might survive this and live to embrace our families again. I then lay out my plan. I see despair and fear in their eyes, but even more powerfully than that, I see hope and trust. Hope that they will again set foot on terra firma, trust that I will get them there. I have never been more proud of them than I am at this moment. However things turn out, my pride in my men will forever be untarnished. Using the Phillips head screwdriver of my Swiss Army knife, brought on board against all regulations, 
I removed the plate that is stenciled NASA UR573 connector panel. I then reverse polarity on the purple cable marked C oxy stroke 92 and then run an extra lead into it from the thrust M63 conduit. There is a momentary arcing action and my fingertips are singed. I ignore the pain. If I am right, burnt fingertips will be a small price to pay. If I am wrong, then either incineration upon re entry or eventual asphyxiation among the stars is our destiny. I alert mission control that I'm going to attempt manual re-entry, and that I've diverted some of our precious oxygen supply to the thrusters. This will have a seriously compromising effect on our heat shields. Houston is not enthused, but unable to suggest an alternative, gives assent. While I have piloted some of the most advanced aircraft in the world, supersonic jet fighters and stealth bombers amongst them, I am at heart a simple stick and rudder man. These are the skills that I now rely on. Adjusting the pitch and yaw in a classic fly-by-wire maneuver, I start to bring us in. Any mistake, no matter how small in our angle of approach, will result in either our simply skipping off the Earth's atmosphere into the emptiness of space, or shattering like a crystal goblet hitting the marble floor. There is no margin of error, no room for second chances. A little power to the thrusters, an almost imperceptible change in our bearing. A minor adjustment in the vector ratio, and receive an almost indiscernible jolt. Suddenly we are through. We've re-entered the atmosphere. Now my greatest challenge is to keep our strongest and most intact heat shield oriented toward our angle of approach. The shield is failing. To an outside observer, a flaming meteor is approaching planet Earth. Inside the capsule, things are getting very warm indeed. I am still conscious and at the controls. I am adjusting pitch and yaw at factors of less than one degree, all in an attempt to prevent our total immolation before we touch down. The capsule is starting to fill with smoke. My first officer, the man to my right, is already unconscious and starting to turn blue from lack of oxygen. The lieutenant major on my left is coughing violently, and his bulging eyes tell me that this cannot go on much longer. Still, I keep my hands on the controls, which are becoming very hot to the touch. We are burning up. Just as the controls become too hot to handle, which occurs at the exact same moment that I can no longer see them due to the smoke, we splash down into the Indian Ocean with a mighty roar and an even greater sound of tss. Our flames are doused. I feel rather than hear the mighty rotors of the Navy helicopter and the solid kathunk as its hook latches onto us. We are lifted out of the sea and brought onto the flight deck of the aircraft carrier USS Fortitude. I can only imagine the anxiety of the sailors as they undo the bolts on the hatch, not knowing if they will find living astronauts or just our charred remains. I see first one young online face, grave with concern, then another, and then even more peering in. I ask them in a crisp tone if they have forgotten how to salute a superior officer. They immediately snap a smart one. It is then that I smile and tell them, at ease. My two comrades are removed from the capsule on stretchers and brought below to sickbay. I feel that for the good of the program, it is important that the commander be seen walking out unassisted. In the days, weeks, and months that follow, we three are hailed as heroes. Gradually, more and more attention is focused on me. The largest circulation weekly news magazine has a cover photograph of me gazing thoughtfully out towards the Atlantic Ocean. The headline announces a full-length interview with the man who brought them home. In all public appearances, interviews, and speeches, I modestly give full credit for a miraculous return to, in ascending order, the terrific ground crew at Mission Control, my companions, the two finest astronauts to ever wear the uniform, and Almighty God. I will soon be announcing my candidacy for either governor or senator of my home state. This will be a stepping stone to my eventual bid for the White House. Thank you.